All right, welcome back. This is our final lesson on radical expressions. So let's go ahead and knock out these last few examples. Number 24 on the handout sheet that I gave you in class, number 24 says t to the 2 thirds power divided by 5t to the 1 half power multiplied by t to the negative 3 fourths. I need to write this a little larger so that you guys can probably see it on the camera. Number 24 says t to the 2 thirds power divided by 5t to the 1 half power multiplied by t to the negative 3 fourths power. Now, uh, this is a uh, common, well not common, but this question actually appears on your SOL from time to time. This is uh, one of the release questions from the state of Virginia. And so if I had to uh, emphasize the difficulty level of your SOL, your SOL focuses on some of the most difficult problems in some of the sections in this book. So this is a very important example to understand. So we're looking here at notice. Is there any addition in this problem? Absolutely not. We have 5 times t to the 1 half times t to the negative 3 fourths. So everything is multiplication. We have multiplication everywhere. So if there's multiplication, remember, laws of exponents refer to the operation of multiplication. So since there's no addition, we can purely use laws of exponents to solve this. Or, I'm sorry, not to solve, but to simplify this. Now, we're going to start by combining our exponents on the bottom. Remember, if the bases match and we are multiplying, we can add the exponents. Now here, Notice that our denominators do not match. When we add fractions 1 half plus 3 fourths, for example, now that's a negative 3 fourths, so we have to be careful. Let's go ahead and make it negative 3 fourths. Okay, so to add fractions, what do we need? We need a common denominator, so we need the denominators to match. We want to make one of them larger. We can't make the 4 larger to match the 2, but we can make the 2 larger to match the 4, so we're going to multiply by 2 over 2. Notice whatever we do to the bottom, we do to the top. This is 2 over 4 plus negative 3 over 4. And remember, our denominator does not change. The denominator 4, we add the top. 2 plus negative 3 gives negative 1. So we end up with 1 half plus negative 3 fourths gives negative 1 fourth. So our, on the bottom, after combining these, when there's multiplication, we add our exponents. So 1 half plus negative 3 fourths, we get a common denominator. We're going to multiply 1 half by 2 over 2. And this becomes this becomes 2 over 4. So we have t to the 2 over 4 power. And notice now we have 5. 5 is not going to change. We're going to multiply here. This is t 2 fourths plus negative 3 fourths is negative 1 fourth. And on top we have t to the 2 thirds power. Now, now that we've combined on the bottom, we now look at the numerator and the denominator. Remember that if we have division and our bases match, we can subtract the exponents. 5 minus 2 gives 3 reminding you that when we subtract exponents, our result lies in the numerator. For instance, if I have x squared divided by x to the fifth, when we subtract and we get x to the two subtract five, we end up with x to the negative third, but the result lies in the numerator, and we have to then move the x to the negative third back to the bottom, and this is one over x to the third. So, here, we are going to subtract our exponents. If we're going to subtract, we need a common denominator. So we're going to ask ourselves, how can we make 3 and 4 match? Well, we can multiply the 2 thirds by 4 over 4, and we can multiply the negative 1 fourth by 3 over 3. So in this case, we end up with t, 2 times 4 is 8, 3 times 4 is 12, we have 8 twelfths, so we're going to multiply, multiply, top and bottom, over 5t, and negative 1 times 3 is negative 3, 4 times 3 is 12. So we end up with 5t to the negative 3 twelfths. Now we're going to subtract our exponents. And remember, after subtracting, the result will lie in the numerator, regardless of whether after subtraction we get a positive or a negative exponent. So we're going to now have 5 is going to stay in the denominator. So we're going to have a denominator with a 5 down here. And we're going to subtract 8 twelfths minus 3 twelfths. So if we look at 8 twelfths, subtract negative 3 twelfths, remember that Subtract negative. When we have two negatives, this becomes addition. Two negatives between, I should say. So we're going to have now 8 plus 3 is 11 over 12. So we end up with t to the 11 over 12. And remember, final answers have to be in radical form and asking, will we be able to take out a group here? Absolutely not. We have an index of 12, and the numerator is smaller. So we're going to end up with the 12th root of t to the 11th over 5. And we cannot take out a group of 12 t's because our numerator was smaller than our index or our denominator. 
The index is 12, means we need a group of 12. When will we be able to take out a group? When, we will, when will we be able to take out a group when the numerator is larger than the denominator? So let's look at the next example. Uh, I've created a uh, sub-example here. T to the one-half power over... No, I'm sorry. I'm writing this wrong. T to the one-half power multiplied by T to the negative two-thirds power over... 5t to the 5 sixth power. Now in this case, I'm going to go ahead and show you a trick. Since we have denominators of 6, 3, I'm sorry, 2, 3, and 6, we can get a common denominator in all of our fractions before we start, since we're going to have to add on top and subtract with what's on the bottom on our exponents. So let's go ahead and think. If we have a 2, a 3, and a 6, we're going to find what's called the least common multiple. And the least common multiple is a very, it's a large number. Okay, so students get confused between greatest common factor, least common multiple. Least common multiple is a big number. It's backwards. Greatest common factor is a small number. So least, well, we call it the LCM. I'm going to write it. Least common multiple. The least common multiple is a large number. Now, I always tell Take your largest number, 6, and start writing its multiples. So we have 6, 12, 18, 24, etc. So we write the multiples of 6, and we're looking for the least or the smallest multiple of 6 that 2 and 3 both go into. And hopefully you say, well, that is just 6 itself. So our least common multiple is the smallest of the large numbers, 6, 12, 18, 24. Our smallest number that 6, 3, and 2 all go into is 6. So we're going to make our denominators all equal to 6, or our least common multiple. Now, so we're going to multiply the 1 half by what? 3 over 3. To make a 2, 6, we multiply by 3. To make the negative 2 thirds a denominator of 6, we're going to multiply by 2 over 2. And down here, since we already have a denominator of 6, we're just going to leave it alone. Now, our result comes out to, in this case, 1 half times 3 times 2 thirds, I'm sorry, 1 half times 3 over 3 is 3 over 6, and 1 half, I'm sorry, negative 2 thirds times 2 over 2 is going to be negative 4 over 6. So we end up with 3 6 and negative 4 6. Let me write these in the same format. 3 6 and negative 4 6. I'm going to cross these out. And what are we doing when the bases match? And we are multiplying, we are adding our exponents. So we have 3, 6 plus negative 4, 6. If the denominators match, the denominators do not change when we add. 3 plus negative 4 is negative 1 over 6. And we end up with 5t to the 5, 6 on the bottom. Now, now we can simply use our property of subtracting exponents. Okay, so in this case, we take the top, subtract the bottom. If the bases match, notice t matches t, we can subtract our exponents. So we're going to do negative 1 6, subtract 5 6. Notice we have two negatives, uh, not both between. But if two things are negative, we can simply add. We end up with negative 6 over 6, which is just negative 1. So when we re subtract these, we get t to the negative 1 power. Remember that our result after subtraction lies in the numerator over 5. Now, final answer. Remember, in our final answers, we cannot have negative exponents. So we're going to move our t to the negative 1 where? To the bottom. So this final answer, if we move it to the bottom, what's left on top? Just a 1. And our final answer is 5t. So our final answer is 1 over 5t. Now, Number 25, let's look at what happens. Uh, well, no, let's move to 29 for a minute. Number 29. See, so number 29 says a over the root of 3b. So looking at this problem, this problem is already written in radical form. So we don't have to convert the final answer to radical form. It's already in radical form. But what do we notice about this problem? We're simplifying. Uh, we cannot add, subtract, multiply, or divide here. But we look at our sub-rules. Notice that we cannot have any radicals in the denominator. We have to get rid of any radicals in the denominator. Notice we have a radical root 3b in the denominator. And in this case, to get rid of the radical, we're going to multiply by the root with the same index. Since this is square root, we're going to multiply by square root and square root. And the question is, how many threes do we need to create a group? We want to take groups out. 
since our index is 2, we need a total of two threes, and also we need a total of two Bs. How many threes do we have? Well, we only have one three, and we only have, well, one B. So we need to create a group of two threes, a group of two Bs, by putting in more threes and more Bs. Okay, so if we have one three, how many more threes do we need? Well, we need one more three. If we have one B, we need one more B. So we're going to multiply by root of three B, root of three B, and now on the bottom we have the root of three squared, B squared, and on top, we just glue this together. Since A is not under a radical, we just put it on the outside, A root 3B. We just glue this together under the operation of what? Multiplication. Now, on the bottom, we can take out pairs. Take out pairs. Why? Because we've created groups. So we end up with a pair of 3s coming out, giving just a 3, a pair of Bs coming out, giving just a B, and on top, we have A root 3B. And the question is, have we successfully gotten the root out of the denominator? Yes, we have. Now. Notice that the final answer does not have a root in the denominator, and this is it. This is done. Now, we're looking at number 25 now. Notice number 25 is slightly different. We have 2z to the 1 half power over z to the 1 half power subtract 1. Now, students look at this problem at first and say, hey, uh, this looks completely different than anything I've ever seen in this class. This does not look... This does not look familiar to my eyes, because notice, what do we have in the denominator? We have addition. But in fact, in the previous lessons, you've already seen an example just like this. We have addition in the denominator. Now, let's go ahead and convert this to radical form, and you will immediately see something that looks recognizable. So let's take z to the 1 half and convert this to radical. We end up with 2 root z over, down here we have the root of z, subtract 1. Notice, this looks awfully familiar to the examples in the previous videos where we had 3 over 5 minus the root of 2. Notice we had a radical in the denominator and we had subtraction or addition. So if addition or subtraction is in the denominator, in order to get rid of our root, remember, when there's multiplication or we don't, I should say, when there's no addition in the denominator, to get rid of the root, we just simply create groups by multiplying by another root. However, when there's addition separating, when there's addition separating, we have to multiply by something called the conjugate. Now, remember that conjugate means opposite middle sign. So, for example, if I say x minus 5, the conjugate of x minus 5 is to change what? Change the middle sign. So, this is the conjugate of x minus 5 is x plus 5. If I say negative 3 minus 5i root 7, the conjugate does not mean change front sign. Notice that the x did not change we change just the middle sign. So the negative 3, the front sign, is not going to change, but we're going to change the middle sign, the negative, to a positive, and this is negative 3 plus 5i root 7. So our conjugate means change middle sign, and in order to get rid of a root, in order to rationalize our denominator, in order to rationalize the denominator, or to get rid of the radicals in the denominator, when there is addition or subtraction, we must multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. Now, since our denominator is root z minus 1, the conjugate will mean opposite middle sign. So we're going to multiply by root z plus 1 on the bottom. If we do this to the bottom, we have to do this to the top, root z plus 1. Now, notice we have a binomial and a binomial. Let's go ahead and go down here and FOIL root z minus 1 multiplied by root z plus 1. Notice we're going to take our first term and multiply by both. Root z times root z is just z. Now, reminding you, root 2, this has to become automatic. Root 2 times root 2 is the root of 4, but you get tired of writing the root of 4. The root of 4 is just 2. The root of 3 times the root of 3 is the root of 9. I don't want you guys writing root of 9 on your paper, but in this case, root of 9 is just 3. So what are we going to say? We're going to say that root 2 times root 2, the roots cancel out, giving just 2. The root of 3 times the root of 3 is just 3. The root of 5 times the root of 5 is just 5. And the root of x times the root of x is just x. They cancel out. So if we're looking at, if we're looking at root of z multiplied by root of z, this is just z. Now the root of z times the 1, since the z is underneath the root and the 1 is not, we just glue this together. This is positive 1 root z, and we don't write the 1. This is not necessary, so we're just going to say that this is plus root z. 
Now, negative 1 times both, we're going to take the negative 1 times the root z. We write this as negative 1 root z is written as negative root z. And negative 1 times the 1 is negative 1. Now, remember when we multiply conjugates, what happens in the center? We're adding now. We're done multiplying, we're adding. When we add, something must match. So we're looking at what's in front of the root z. The root z will not change. What is 1 minus 1? Okay, so we have 1 minus 1. 1 minus 1 is 0 root z. And if we get 0 root z, this is just 0, and we do not write it. So when we multiply conjugates, the center cancels out. So our center is gone, and we just end up with z minus 1. Now, we're looking at a denominator now of z minus 1. And on top, we're going to take notice this, this is no addition. This is a monomial. We're going to multiply monomial times binomial. Remember, when multiplication meets addition, distributive property applies. So we're going to do 2 root z times root z. If we're looking at 2 root z multiplied by root z, Remember that root z times root z is just z. So we end up with 2z. Okay, so we multiply the radicals together. So root z times root z is just z, and we put the 2 in front. So we have 2z, and now the 2 root z times the 1 gives plus 2 root z. And notice, this is our final answer because have we successfully gotten the radical out of the denominator? Yes, there is no more. There is no more square root in the denominator, so we are done. Now, this is kind of hard to look at because we have variable, variable. I'm going to give you another example like was given in the previous video, but I'm going to give it in exponential form. This will look more familiar to your eyes because it doesn't have z, it has numbers. So we're looking at 3 to the 1 half minus 2 to the 1 half power over 3 to the 1 half plus 2 to the 1 half. Now, we're going to immediately convert this to radical form. So we're going to write this as the square root of 3 minus the square root of 2 over the square root of 3 plus the square root of 2. And notice, do we have radicals in the denominator? Yes. Now, what else do we have in the denominator? Well, we have addition separating the radicals. If there is addition in the denominator and we want to get rid of the radicals, notice we have to rationalize the denominators or get rid of radicals in the denominator, we multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. And remember, conjugate means change middle sign. So we're going to look at the conjugate of the denominator. Since there's addition, we're going to write the conjugate is root 3 minus root 2. If we do this to the bottom, we also have to do this to the top, root 3 minus root 2. And notice we have a binomial times a binomial on the bottom. And we have a binomial times a binomial on top. So we're going to take root 3 plus root 2 and multiply by root 3 minus root 2. Remember, when we multiply conjugates, what happens? The center cancels out. So we're looking at root 3. Take the first term and multiply by both. Root 3 times root 3. Hopefully, at this point, you say root 3 times root 3 is just 3. Now, root 3 times the root 2. Multiply the radicands together. Remember? We can multiply radicands, but we cannot add. So if we say root of x multiplied by root of y, this is the root of xy. This question is on your test. Is this true or false? This is true. However, the root of x plus the root of y is not equal to the root of x plus y. We cannot add the radicands together. Saying this in simple terms, if I write the root of 2 multiplied by the root of 3, can we multiply the radicands? Yes, this is the root of 6. But if I say the root of 2 plus the root of 3, can we add the 2 to the 3 and get the root of 5? No. This is wrong. And the only time, the only time we can add is if something matches. So we cannot add the radicands together. But if I write root 3 plus, say, 7 root 3, if we're adding, something must match. And what matches doesn't change. So there is a special rule for addition. The root 3 does not change. We can add what's in front. 1 plus 7 gives 8 root 3. So this is acceptable. But it is not acceptable to add the radicands. So notice, you cannot add the 3 and the 3 and get root of 6. That is not correct to add the radicands. So looking here, can we do root 3 times root 2? Yes, we end up with the root of 6. And now the root of 2, oh, I'm sorry. We have positive root 3. Positive root 3 times negative root 2 is negative root 6. And now we're going to take the second term and multiply by both. The positive root 2 times the positive root 3 is a positive root 6. And the positive root 2 times the negative root 2, positive times negative is negative. Root 2 times root 2 is just 2. Notice, we have a negative root 6 and a plus root 6. Can we add if something matches? Yes. 
We add what's in front, and what matches doesn't change. So we add the negative 1 plus 1 gives 0. Remember when we add, or I'm sorry, when we multiply conjugates, the center will cancel out. So we end up with 0 root 6, which cancel out. Now 3 minus 2 gives a denominator of 1. So our final answer is going to have a denominator of 1, which we will not have to write. So I guess this is technically not going to be our final answer, final answer but let's just go ahead and put the 1 for now. And on top, notice this is a binomial times a binomial. Notice that these are identical, but since they're not conjugates, the center is not going to cancel out. Watch what happens. Root 3 times root 3 is 3. Root 3 times the negative root 2 is negative root 6. The negative root 2 times the root 3 is negative root 6. And the negative root 2 times the negative root 2, negative times negative is positive, and root 2 times root 2 is 2. So on top we end up with, and we're, we're on our final answer here, we're not going to write the denominator of 1. We're just going to ignore it. So 3 plus 2, add the numbers. 3 plus 2 is 5. And the negative root 6, negative root 6 do not cancel out. When the signs are the same, we add. And notice, what matches doesn't change. So the root 6 will not change. We add what's in front. Negative 1 plus negative 1 is negative 2. So we end up with 5 minus 2 root 6, and we do not write the denominator of 1, so our final answer is just 5 minus 2 root 6, and we are done. Now, so this looks more familiar to your eyes than the last problem did, hopefully. Now, we're looking now at the last few examples, number 26, and these are interesting because we're going to add a few more extra rules to our laws of exponents. I'm going to remind you of all the little details of the laws of exponents right here. So we're looking at First, number 26 says the tenth root of 8 to the fifth power. Now, you guys first look at this problem and say, well, I've got to simplify. I've got to either add, subtract, multiply, or divide. But what is there to do here? We have 5 eighths. Can we take out a group of 10? No. But if we look at this, we can write this as the tenth root. I'm sorry, we can write this out of radical form, back in exponential form, if we write this as 8 to the 5 over 10, you immediately see that the exponent reduces. So we can say 5 over 10 divided each by 5. This is what? 5 divided by 5 is 1. We get 8 to the 1 half power, which is rewritten as the square root of 8. So our final answer must be in radical form. Uh, let's look at some other examples. We're not done with this. This is actually has to, we have to go a little further here, but let's look at the sixth root of x to the third power. The sixth root of x to the third. Notice that this is x to the three sixth power, which is x to the one half, which is the square root of x. Notice we can write this as three over six and reduce it. Three over six reduces to one half because we divide the numerator and the denominator by three. So what I want you guys to see is that you can reduce right here. Do you see that you can divide each of these by 3 and get x to the first power, and this index becomes a 2, which is the square root of x? Let's practice. If I write the eighth root of x to the fourth, we can reduce this, divide them each by 4, and we end up with what? A 1 and a 2. So we end up with the square root of x. Oh, this may really confuse. Okay, so we end up with square root of x. I don't know if I mentioned this on the, on the absolute value video or not, but in this case, we have even and even. There's an odd result. The radicand must be positive by assumption. This is actually the square root of the absolute value of x. So this is actually square, but, but minor detail. What I need you to know for this class primarily is that the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x, but the square root of x multiplied by the square root of x is just x. But interesting example that the fourth root and the, the fourth the four and the eight cancel out we can get one and two which is the square root of the absolute value of x now if i write the seventh root or let's do this i'm sorry the 14th root of x to the seventh well here we don't have even even we have an odd even so you don't have to worry about absolute value you can cancel seven with 14 and we get one two which is the square root of x so there's a nice way to think of this as instead of writing it in exponential form, you can just cancel here. So you can cancel your, or you can divide your exponent and your index by 7. This is pretty cool. Now, we're not done with the first example up here, number 26. Uh, notice, when we get to our final answer, we have to ask. This, is, this, was, uh, this was our exponential form here. 
and this is our radical form, but we also always have to ask, always have to ask if can we take out groups in the end? Yes, you can. You can take the 8 and break it down. It's 2 times 4, which is what? 2 times 2. So we end up with the square root of 2 to the third power. Can we take out a pair of 2s? Yes, we can. We take out a pair of 2s. We get 1, 2 on the outside. Remember, every group becomes 1. And what's left under the root? Well, we took out two twos. There's 1, 2 left. So this is 2 root 2 is the final answer. Now, a few more here. Number 27 is the square root of 12 multiplied by the fifth root of 12 to the third. Now, something interesting to note here. Uh, can we multiply this together? Can we multiply the 12 times the 12? Can we multiply the 12 times the 12 and get uh, some sort of root of 12 to the fourth power? And the answer is no. Let's go ahead and talk about this property of roots. So I'm going to erase this off the board. And we're going to add some more rules to our laws of exponents here. So looking at, going back to this, can we multiply, can we multiply root of 2 times root of 3 and get the root of 6? Yes, we can multiply our radicands together. Reminding you, you cannot do the root of 2 plus the root of 3 and get the root of 5. We cannot add the radicands, we cannot add the radicands together, but the root of 2 plus the root of 3 is, we're, we're just stuck. This is already already simplified. Now, there's a new exponent law we're going to add here. What happens, notice, we can write this as 2 to the 1 half multiplied by 3 to the 1 half is equal to 6 to the 1 half. So I should ask this question. If I write 2 to the 1 half multiply by 3 to the 1 half, what happens when the exponents match? So going over here to this, when the bases match, x matches x, we add the exponents. But what happens when our exponents match? If our exponents match, we multiply the base. So this is 2 times 3 is 6 to the 1 half power. So you guys see that this is rewritten as square root of 2 multiplied by square root of 3 is the square root of 6. So if I say x here, if I say 2 to the x power, multiply by 3 to the x power, notice that our exponents match. We can write this as, notice, if the exponents match, we can multiply the base and get 6 to the x power. So if the exponents match, you can multiply the base. So this is 6 to the x. So here, notice, do our exponents match? They do not. Notice if we rewrite this in exponential form. This is 12 to the 1 half multiplied by uh, 12 to the 3 fifths power, 12 to the 1 half multiplied by 12 to the 3 fifths. So the only time we can multiply the bases together, 12 times 12 cubed, and get some sort of root of 12 to the 4th, is when the exponents match. So my question is, can we multiply the 12 and the 12? No. Why? Because the exponents do not match. Remember, in order to multiply your base, your exponents must match. So in this case, since our exponents do not match, you cannot multiply the 12 and the 12. You know, if you think square root of 2 times square root of 3 gives the square root of 6, why can we multiply these together? Because we have 2 to the 1 half times 3 to the 1 half, which is 6 to the 1 half, or I should say 2 to the 1 half times 3 to the 1 half, the exponents match. Another way of saying this is that your index, your index must match. So square root times square root, we get another root. Notice if the exponents match, the exponent will not change. We multiply the base, we get 6 to the 1 half. So if I say square root of x multiplied by the square root of y, do the exponents match? Yes, they do. This is x to the 1 half multiplied by y to the 1 half. Since the exponents match, we can say that this is xy to the 1 half power, or the square root of xy. However, like this problem, if I say square root of x multiplied by the cubed root of y, can we multiply x times y and get some sort of root of xy? No, we cannot. Because the exponents do not match. This is x to the 1 half times y to the 1 third. The exponents do not match, so we cannot multiply our base together. So what do we do instead? If the exponents do not match, you cannot multiply the 12 and the 12. We use the other property. Notice what does match. What does match is our base. Since our base is matched, what can we do with the exponent? We can add the exponent. So since 12 matches 12, 
we can add our exponents one half and three fifths. Remember, we need a common denominator, and we need to find the least common multiple. Least common multiple of the two and the five, we start with the largest number, five. So write our multiples of five. Five, 10, 15, 20, and the least common multiple is a large number. So we're asking which is, it's the, I should say, it's the smallest of the large numbers. So which of these large numbers is the smallest number that both 2 and 5 go into? That is 10. So 10 is our least common multiple. This is what we want our denominators to be. So we're going to multiply 1 half by what? Well, we need to multiply, to make a 10, we need to multiply the 2 by 5 and the top also by 5. To make a 10 here, we multiply the 5 by 2 and the top also by 2. Now, we end up with 1 times 5 is 5, 2 times 5 is 10, so we end up with 12 to the 5 tenths. And here, I'll just write, rewrite the problem. This is 12 to the 5 tenths multiplied by 12 to the 3 times 2 is 6, 5 times 2 is 10, we get 12 to the 6 tenths. Now, notice the bases match. We're going to add our exponents. 12 to 5 tenths plus 6 tenths, when we add fractions, the denominator does not change, we get 11 tenths. Now the question is, are we done? No, we're not, because the numerator is larger than the denominator. We rewrite our final answer in radical form. The tenth root of 12 to the 11th, because the numerator is larger, we can take out a group. We want to take out groups of 10. We have 11 12s. We can take out a group of 10 12s, which leaves us 12 on the outside. And what's left under the root? Well, since we took out 10, there's one 12 left. So this is our final answer. Now. A couple more quick examples, and we are done. Number 28. <coughs> Number 28 says the fourth root of 6 multiplied by 3 times the fourth root of 6. Now, there are two different exponent laws that you can use here. I want you to write this in exponential form as 6 to the 1 fourth power multiplied by 3 multiplied by 6 to the 1 fourth power. So we're going to convert this to exponential form. And notice, do the exponents match? Remember, if the exponents match, what can we do with our base? We can multiply the base 3 times 2 and get 6. Do the exponents match? Yes, they do. So we can multiply the 6 by the 6. We're going to do this two different ways. So first, we notice that our exponents match. We can multiply the base 6 times 6 and get base 36. And the exponent stays the same, 1 fourth. And go ahead and put your times 3 out front. So we end up with 3 times. Now let's convert this back to radical form, the fourth root of 36. Now are we done? No. We can take the 36 and break it down. 36 is oh, uh, 6 times 6, which is 2 times 3, 2 times 3. So we're going to write this as 3 times the fourth root of there are two twos and two threes. So two squared times three squared. And notice, can we reduce? Notice you see that this is two fourths. This is two fourths. We can cancel. We can divide the exponent and the index by two. So we're going to have two fourths. Well, maybe that's not a, I don't maybe not a good idea here. This is the fourth root of two squared times three squared. We can write this as two to the 2 fourths power times 3 to the 2 fourths power, reduce 2 fourths, reduce 2 fourths, we end up with 2 to the 1 half times 3 to the 1 half, which is what? Square root of 2 multiplied by square root of 3, which is the square root of 6. So our final answer, this becomes square root of 6. We can write this as 3 times the square root of 6. I guess an easier way of looking at this is to say that 36 is 6 squared. So we can look at this as the fourth root of 6 squared, and we can cancel the 2 with the 4. 2 divided by 2 is a 1. 4 divided by 2 is a 2. We end up with 3 square root of 6. Why? Because this was an exponent 2 fourths, which reduced to an exponent of 1 half. So this is the final answer. But there's a much easier way to do this. Watch. So my question is, which property is easier? Which property is easier? Well, the property on the left, if the bases match, you can add the exponents, is an easier property. Notice, our exponents match, but what else matches? We also notice that our bases match. 6 matches 6. So what's an easier property? If the bases match, you can add your exponents. This property is always easier. 
If the base is matched, you can add your exponents, 2 plus 3, and get 5. So notice, the second way to do this problem is to notice that the base is matched. We can add 1 fourth and 1 fourth. So we end up with 3 times 6 matches 6, so the 6 will not change. Add the 1 fourth and the 1 fourth. We get 2 fourths. We can reduce this as 3 times 6 to the 1 half power, which is 3 times the square root of 6, and we're done in much less time. So I always tell students, which of these two properties is easier to use? If the base is matched, you add the exponents, is always an easier property. Now, last example. This is one like your homework questions. Looking at, and this should be, I think, fairly simple at this point, the sixth root of 3 divided by the sixth, oh, the fourth root of 27. Now, what we have to notice immediately, we have to notice immediately is we have 3 uh, to the 1 6th power, go ahead and write this in exponential form, and 27 to the 1 4th, we can break down the 27, break down the 27 to 3 times 9, which is 3 times 3. So we have 3 3's, so we're going to write this as the 4th root of 3 to the 3rd. So go ahead and rewrite this as the 4th root of 3 to the 3rd. We can write this as 3 to the 3 fourths power. Notice, what have we done here? Notice that the base does not, the original problem, the original problem, the bases did not match. Remember, this is 3 here. Let's go ahead and just do this. 3 to the 1 6, uh, 27 to the 1 fourth power. Notice, there are two exponent laws that we're interested in here. Or, well, if the exponents match, we multiply the base. If the bases match, we can either add the exponents, or if the bases match, we can subtract the exponents. Notice, do the exponents match? No, they do not. Do the bases match? No, they do not. So we have to either get the exponents to match or get the bases to match. In this case, we can get our bases to match by taking our 27 and breaking it down to 3 times 9, which is 3 times 3. This is what I should have said first. There are three threes, so we're going to write this as the fourth root of 3 to the third. Now, we can write this as now 3 to the 1 6th power over 3 to the 3 fourths power. So have we gotten something to match? Yes. We've managed to get our bases to match. So if our bases match and we are dividing, we can subtract the exponents. Remember that the result after, subtraction, result after subtracting exponents lies in the numerator. So we're going to subtract 3 fourths and 1 6 and 3 fourths. Now, we need a common denominator, 6 and 4. And to find a common denominator, we need to find the least common multiple. Reminder, we start with our larger number, 6, 12, 18, 24. We write its multiples, and we find the least or the smallest of these large numbers that both 4 and 6 go into. What's the smallest number that both 4 and 6 go into? Hopefully you say 12. Okay, so we're going to make our denominators equal to 12. So we're going to multiply the 1 over 6... 6 has to multiply by 2, so 2 over 2, and the 4 has to multiply by 3, so 3 over 3. We end up with 3 to the 2 sixth power, oh, I'm sorry, 3 to the 2 twelfths power over 3 to the 9 twelfths power. Now we're going to subtract our exponents because the bases match. We can subtract our exponents. 2 twelfths minus 9 twelfths gives 3 to the negative, well, let me write it like this, 2 twelfths minus 9 twelfths gives 3 to the negative 7 twelfths. Now, reminder, our answer lies in the numerator. After subtracting exponents, the answer lies in the numerator. So we have 3 to the negative 7 twelfths in the numerator, and remember, we have to get rid of negative exponents. We cannot have negative exponents in the final answer, so this becomes 1 over 3 to the 7 twelfths we move the 3 to the negative 12, 7 twelfths to the bottom, the exponent becomes positive. Now rewrite this in radical form. This is 1 over the 12th root of 3 to the 7th. And we have to create, notice we have a radical in the denominator. We have to get the radical out. We have to create a group of 12 threes. Now since we only have 7, how many more threes do we need to create a group of 12? Hopefully you say we need 5 more threes. Since the index is 12, we have to multiply by 12th root. 12th root, we have 7 3's, we need 5 more. So we're going to multiply by the 12th root of 3 to the 5th. And our final answer, I'm just going to write it over here because we're out of space. Final answer is the 12th root, 1 times anything is itself. 
the twelfth root of three to the fifth. Well, I guess technically not the final. On the bottom, we get the twelfth root of three to the twelfth. And can we take out a group of twelve threes? Yes. Here is our final answer. Taking out a group of twelve threes gives a three and nothing left underneath the radical. And on top, remember, we are simplifying, which means add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So you cannot do this anymore. So you have to notice you cannot take out a group of twelve threes, so you have to multiply the threes back together. So we have five threes. Three times three times three times three times three. This is nine times nine is 81 times three is 243. So we get the 12th root of 243 over three. And this is our final answer. And this concludes radical expressions. Good luck on your homework, guys.